Good evening, everyone. My name is Jack Negro, and I'm a superintendent with the Durham District School Board and adjunct professor at York University. Welcome to session two of the 12th annual Faculty of Education Summer Institute at York University. Tonight's webinar is the second of a series of webinars replacing our August 2020 conference, which was modified in response to the pandemic. We begin all our uh, gatherings with the land acknowledgement. Today, wherever we are in Ontario, we are on traditional Indigenous territories. We thank Indigenous peoples for sharing their land with us. We recognize the role that colonialism has played to shape a society and an education system that has oppressed Indigenous peoples on this land and in our school system. The settlers among us recognize that our settler ancestors committed genocide against Indigenous people. We also recognize that the school system we lead and work in is a reflection of that colonialism and genocide. In the spirit of truth and reconciliation, we gather together on these traditional Indigenous territories and recommit to transform our education system and whatever system we work in to decolonize our practices and our minds and to honor indigenous histories, culture and perspectives today and every day in our systems, schools and classrooms. Tonight's webinar is co-hosted by Dr. J Carl James and myself. Carl and I are the last remaining originals of this summer institute and it has been a labor of love for both of us for the past 12 years. Carl and I first want to acknowledge the outstanding organizational team associated with this year's Institute. Professor Vidya Shah, Saima Chowdhury, and Sultan Rana, all instructors in the Faculty of Education at York University and passionate advocates of equity and inclusive education. The Institute was born of a collaboration that became, uh, began in meetings focused on identity-based data collection. Dr. James led these discussions, noting that identity-based data collection might provide the neatest, needed stimulus to once and for all disrupt the long established achievement and opportunity gaps of students who identified as racialized, LGBTQ, of lower socioeconomic backgrounds, and other marginalized groups. These data had long existed south of the border, but were less prevalent here. Then came the Equity and Inclusive Education Strategy published in 2009 by the Ontario Ministry of Education. This provided another catalyst and small amount of funding for more discussions. At the time, Dr. James was a director of the York Center for Education and Community. A group of us gathered at York U one afternoon and began to plan the first summer institute, and we haven't looked back since. It has always been the goal of this institute to disrupt and dismantle, to ask good questions, necessary questions, to get in good trouble, to challenge institutions, to challenge policymakers, to initiate real change that makes a difference for historically marginalized students, to be fearless in naming things, calling them out. The problems we discuss have been problems for too many years. Too many students have suffered injustices in Ontario schools because of these problems. Our students can't wait any longer. The Institute has always invited educators to work alongside community and agency partners, recognizing that we are better together. Educators, you are most likely daily visitors to your school's landscape. Community and agency partners are key in the lives of your students. You neither have the expertise nor the resources to address every challenge your students face. You need community and agency partners. Know them and work with them to better serve your students. 
We welcome educators and community and agency partners alike in tonight's discussion. Many district, district school boards have been perennial partners in the support of the Institute, which we think is important in terms of ensuring that change happens for children and in institutions. We thank TDSB, TCDSB, York Region District School Board, Peel District School Board, Dufferin Peel Catholic District School Board, Durham DSB, Halton DSB, Halton Catholic DSB, Ottawa Carleton DSB, and Kawartha Pine Ridge DSB for both their past and hopefully ongoing support. It too has always been the goal of this institute to emphasize action as part of the collective learning we do. None of your learning matters unless things are better for kids, especially those who have been underserved by the system the next day. None of the discussions matter unless systems change, schools change, and classroom change. So whether you are an educator, a community partner, or an agency partner, one of our asks tonight is that you think about how you can change what you do to better serve children. Over the years, we've talked about disparities and outcomes and opportunities the system has caused, namely in the suspensions and expulsion of certain groups of students, in achievement in literacy and numeracy, in the disproportionate streaming of black and indigenous students into applied courses. We've talked about curricular violence inflicted on students based on the selection of resources in schools. We've challenged homophobia, transphobia, and Islamophobia. We've talked about the collection of identity-based data to uncover all of these phenomena. And tonight, we're examining another institution in which disproportionalities are evident, the child welfare system. How one institution is taking steps to address this and how its complementary educational institution is working alongside it. To frame tonight's discussion, I'll read a few experts excerpts of a ministry website describing the duty to report suspicion of child endangerment. It impacts on everyone. Section 125 of Ontario's Child, Youth and Family Services Act 2017 states that the public, including professionals who work with children, must promptly report any suspicions that a child is or may be in need of protection to a children's aid society. The children, Child, Youth and Family Services Act defines the phrase, quote, child in need of protection and explains what must be reported to a society. It includes physical, sexual and emotional abuse, neglect and risk of harm. Any professional or official who fails to report a suspicion is liable on conviction to a fine of up to $5,000 if they obtain the information in the course of their professional or official duties. And this is not to mention other sanctions which could, which could be imposed by both their employer and or professional regulating body. Dr. Cindy Blackstock, perhaps Canada's strongest voice in calling out the problems with the child welfare system as it relates to Indigenous to, uh, children, asked the question, residential schools, did they really close or just morph into the child welfare system? Indigenous children are also disproportionately represented in the child welfare system. Tonight, we will hear from both the Toronto Catholic Children's Aid Society who receives over 5,000 referrals a year about children who may be in need in, of protection, with a disproportionate number of those being black children and a majority of the 5,000 coming from schools and police. We will also hear from the Toronto Catholic District School Board, including its director, Dr. Brendan Brown, about addressing this disparity. The format of tonight's webinar is as follows. We'll first hear from Director Brown of the TCDSB for opening remarks, then by Dr. James, who will frame the upcoming panel presentation, and then hear from our panelists representing Toronto Catholic Children's Aid and the TCDSB. Tonight, we are exploring this overarching question. What does the journey towards anti-racist, anti-oppressive 
practice look like in a child welfare agency? How do we walk this path together with our partners in education? Before we start our panel discussion, as well as a bit of background uh, of how this conversation found its way to FESI, I'd like to introduce Dr. Brendan Brown. I wanna start by saying that I've known uh, Dr. Brown. We started our senior administration journey together in Halton Catholic District School Board. I can tell you that he is a systemic disruptor when it comes to systems and structure, structures in special education. He is the co-author co of a leadership book, does mission work in South Africa, in, sorry, in Africa. Um, serves on a board of directors there of a children's hospital. He is um, the proud father of two daughters and uh, has a wife in Toronto. And he finds himself as comfortable in academia as he does in uh, service to school boards. So he has his feet in both worlds. Dr. Brendan Brown is a transformative organizational change leader who brings a wealth of educational leadership in areas related to literacy and numeracy, special education, classroom management, educational technology, and program evaluation. He joins us from uh, a past role in the Toronto District School Board where he most recently served as an executive superintendent overseeing 283 elementary and secondary schools, adult learning, and alt ed sites. At the TDSB, Dr. Brown executed meaningful systemic change focused on inclusion and equity in areas of human resources, financial stewardship, and organizational structures and responses. Prior to this, Dr. Brown devoted over 20 years of service to the Halton District School Board, where he held a number of senior leadership portfolios. He's done some work with the Institute for Catholic Education and the Catholic Principals Council of Ontario, developing uh, four module courses in leadership. His book is entitled Leading for Educational Lives, Inviting and Sustaining Imaginative Acts of Hope in a Connected World. We're so honored to have uh, Dr. Brown here today. Thank you, Brendan, for joining us. And I'll cede the floor over to you. Uh, thanks so much, Jack. It's um, really a pleasure to be here. And I, I appreciate the, the invitation. Um, I, I just got a text from my former um, head of social work in Halton Catholic, who I learned uh, a ton from. And she's on this call right now, just kind of popped in right now. And I thought, okay, now I'm nervous. I wasn't nervous before, but I learned a lot from, from working with. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I want to start by, um, by acknowledging really what's happening in Toronto and throughout the world and appreciating that these conversations that are happening right now as vital to acknowledging systemic racism and the impact that racism has had on black students in our system and the shared responsibility that we have not only to notice and name anti-black racism, but to interrupt, to disrupt systems that perpetuate oppression and to do so intentionally in ways that make tangible impacts on black students here in Toronto and in every, every board across the province. There is an urgency because I recognize these discussions that we're having now, they're the same discussions that we've been having for decades. So change is required, both in the immediate, as every day passes, students are impacted, and those are the students that we're responsible for serving. So as the director of, the, of education of the Toronto Catholic District School Board, I recognize my, my role and my leadership as being paramount to addressing anti-Black racism, equity, and leading from an anti-racist perspective. So I'm really committed to understanding how our system perpetuates outcomes that disproportionately impact black students and how to disrupt in ways that change the outcomes. So this starts really with, for us, understanding who our students are, what are their experiences, who are we serving, and then who are we not serving? So we talked earlier, or Jack mentioned in the comments about data collection, is data informs decision-making. And once we know it, we can't unknow it. So I'm not sure how much time I have, but I will give an example. Um, when I was in the Toronto District uh, School Board, uh, I was tasked with taking a look at, at looking at our systems and structures. 
And um, I was looking at this one program that we had, it was called the KIPP program. And I said, I don't know what that is. Can you tell me what the KIPP program is? And I was told it was a kindergarten intervention program. I said, well, I'm not familiar with that. What is it? Well, the program is one in which it's for students in kindergarten that have uh, behavioral needs and we do an intervention program for them. Um, small class size. And so I said, okay, well, well, show me the data. And the data told me that the, the overwhelming majority of the students that were in the KIPP program were black boys. So I asked, what's their pathway? Where do they go when they leave the kindergarten program? And 90, over 90% 90 of them went into ISP programs, intensive support programs, into applied programs in secondary. And when we see that and we recognize that that pathway that we're putting students on um, makes an impact, we thought we, this program is a structure that we have to disrupt because as long as it exists, it's going to perpetuate the same norms. So we, we got rid of the KIPP program and it, we faced a lot of backlash on it. And I bring that, this up as an example because the backlash we were getting on it was around that idea that we're closing a program for students with special needs. But we had the data and the data was telling us that uh, students, black boys, black students were disproportionately impacted by this program. And if we keep having the same structures, we're gonna get the same outcomes. So it's, it's really an important example of when we have the data to tell us, then we need to act. And so that's something I'm committed to um, you know, in, uh, in Toronto Catholic. And I'm really proud here to, to be speaking with you before a conversation with uh, Catholic Children's Aid and as well as with Vanessa Coco, our lead social worker in Toronto Catholic, uh, because they're gonna be talking a little bit about the data and what the data is saying, as Jack mentioned earlier about how um, black children are disproportionately impacted. And when we know that data, what are we doing about it? And I won't talk more about that because I know it's a big part of tonight. That's a, a, a big part of the work that we're doing in Toronto Catholic and what we're committed to, committing to when it comes to uh, collecting identity-based data. Um, we're also, some things that we're doing in Toronto Catholic, we're, we're starting right now bringing together an anti-black racism, um, virtual town halls of virtual focus groups beginning this November. We're looking forward to engaging with all stakeholders in the system who identify as black because their voice will inform the strategy and our decision-making as we uh, construct our dismantling anti-Black racism strategy. We do this work, we partner with our community partners. We partner with the African Canadian Advisory Committee and they, they really influence our contributions to the work we're doing around anti-Black racism in the TCDSB. And those further community partnerships, which are so important, organizations and agencies, including the Canadian Alliance of Black Educators, Trust 15, Taibu, Plug Project, Power to Girls, one Voice, One Team Youth Leadership Organization. Really, we recognize and embrace that collaborative uh, contribution and the, that power of community. Uh, we've just recently established the Race Relations uh, Committee at the board level to be really making sure that this continues to be at the forefront of the work that we do. And as Jack was talking about the different boards that are involved in um, this work, we really are looking around the province and looking at examples of best practices that are happening in boards around the province. In Toronto Catholic, we're, we're looking at what can we do in the immediate, and then what are what is good, really going to be taking place? Um, it's going to take a little bit of time, because what we can do in the in the immediate, we need to do in the immediate. So for us, that means just in an immediate perspective. Um, for us, Remembrance Day, for example, coming up in a couple of weeks. In Toronto Catholic, we are going to be commemorating Remembrance Day this year through an Afrocentric uh, lens, which will spotlight the contributions of Black military service people. Uh, right now, we're really working on um, some committee work that we've pulled together to take a look at culturally relevant texts and teaching with a, a critical lens on everything that's being taught in our English classes throughout the system with an eye toward text selection, opportunities for critical discourse on race and Black authors and subject matter. Uh, and we are initiating a project to really increase and promote diverse authors in the collections in our library. Uh, what else can we do in, in, the, interim, in the immediate, I beg your pardon, for us, that involves, uh, we have now created every Monday when we meet as a senior team of senior leaders throughout the system, we have a standing item, uh, an hour on every agenda, no matter what's going on, um, with everything that everybody that's on this call knows about um, COVID and the different uh, stresses on school systems. We've got an hour booked every Monday for some critical conversations around equity, anti-Black racism, anti-oppression, really focused on the idea of equity as a leadership competency. Every week, continuing the conversations, because that's what we can commit to, to make sure that we're always leading from that perspective. From a longer term perspective, we're working on 
our human rights policy, developing our human rights policy to streamline the processes around our responses to equity and discrimination as they arise. Uh, really the promotion of our human rights uh, and equity advisor really as that expert and advocate within um, the board to promote, to educate, and to collaborate. We are uh, looking at our policies, that we adopt an anti-racist stance, revising policies and practices to, to make them anti-racist, not just non-racist. And we're looking all of, at all of our policies through that lens of anti-Black racism and anti-oppression. So as specific examples, we're looking at a uniform policy right now through that lens, uh, looking at, at the policy around the use of texts in the classroom. Um, we are really appreciative of the opportunity to continue to engage with the, the Ministry of Education's uh, Equity Secretary, including all of the other um, provincially funded human rights and equity advisors. And, and lastly, something that we're really focused on and very timely because of the announcement made this week around the, the repealing of Reg 274 is that we are taking a critical lens to the hiring, succession planning and processes to really make sure that uh, to increase opportunities for representation in all roles and departments through a Toronto Catholic, making sure students and families see themselves reflected in our staff and in leadership. So I was actually had a conversation this morning with Patrick Case about this work, really in relation to that news around Reg 274. We are really committed to a better understanding of who our staff are, our policies and our practices related to hiring and promotion, and then identifying gaps and developing a plan to address those gaps that will lead to hiring of staff and leaders who better reflect our community. So I'm just gonna sign off just saying that I, I acknowledge, and I, I'm revealing my bias now, I guess. I wanna acknowledge one of your featured speakers today. I'm really proud um, that uh, our lead social worker, Vanessa Coco, is gonna be sharing and speaking with you this evening. Uh, talking about the work in Toronto Catholic along with uh, Catholic Children's Aid. Again, what is the data telling us? But what are we doing about it as a system and in collaboration? So special thanks to uh, Jack Negro and to Dr. Carl James for the invitation this evening. And lastly, I just wanna end on a thank you. Uh, thank you for your ongoing engagement with this work. When I say you, I mean everybody on this call. You're here together, you're here on your own time. Um, you know, it's, it's the middle of the week. We're in the middle of a pandemic and you're here not only because you want to learn but because you are committed and you know that we move this work forward when we, when we do so together. So I'm encouraged by your presence this evening and I wish each and every one of you the very best, not just for this evening, but for the work that you're engaged in and you continue to work toward. And we look forward to doing this work in Toronto Catholic. Thanks so much everyone. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, Sultan, I think my camera is blocked. So because it's on my screen, it says that you blocked it. So let's see. Okay, there we are, we're back. Brendan, thank you. Uh, I, I just wanna highlight some of um, the really important points that you've made, Brendan. Um, really, first about the urgency. Uh, our kids can't wait anymore, you know? Uh, this talk has been going on for so many years and then other things just get in the way. Uh, people lose focus. We have a focus now and it's a collective focus and um, you stating it publicly like that tonight is, is huge. Uh, a director of the largest Catholic board in the country um, saying that is, is a big step and uh, we're looking forward to walking that path with you. Um, other things that Brendan mentioned that are key, really, really looking at structures in the system that will facilitate uh, change. And so you think about um, the people in the system and how they reflect the communities that we serve. Uh, you think about the curriculum that we use and whether it is representative of the voices that we have in our schools and the and authentic voice of the lived experiences of diverse groups. Um, and, and so all of those are necessary things that will move us forward. And uh, once again, we're just really proud to have you on, uh, Dr. Brown, and look forward to working with you and the board and other partners to make this a reality. So thank you very much. Brendan's gonna stay with us uh, as long as he can. I know he has another meeting shortly, but uh, one more time, thanks very much, Dr. Brown.
Thanks for the invitation. It was a real pleasure. Thanks, Chuck. Excellent. Our panelists tonight will speak from a variety of perspectives to paint a holistic portrayal for us on the journey they've been on to bring anti-racist, anti-oppressive practices into their agency. I'm going to introduce the panelists in their speaking order, and I'm going to ask the panelists to say hello to our audience as I introduce them so that they will appear on the camera. All right, so we're gonna start with Kate. Kate, say hello to our audience. Kate, are you there? You're gonna to have to put your mic on. Oh, my apologies. You'd think I'd be used to this by now, having done this for seven months. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Welcome, Kate. Kate Shoemaker is the Manager of Quality Assurance and Outcome Measurement at the Catholic Children's Aid Society of Toronto. She's worked for over 20 years in child welfare and child's mental health, including frontline clinical positions and 10 years producing and implementing child welfare policy for the provincial government. She's passionate about creating a socially just child welfare system and her areas of practice and research interest include poverty, neglect and child welfare decision-making. Our next panelist is Carol. Carol, say hello to our audience. Good evening, everyone. Carol Wade is a social worker and educator. She has over 20 years of experience in the child welfare sector, and she's also a sessional instructor in the School of Social Work at the University of Windsor and at York University. Carol completed her PhD at the University of Toronto with a focus on using a historical trauma lens to understand modern day parenting. Carol has co-facilitated anti-Black racism training with Youth Rex Research and Evaluation Design at York University. Her main area of focus is in using critical theories and pedagogies to deconstruct and challenge oppressive practices to families and young people. Next is Priscilla. Priscilla, say hello to our audience. Hi, everybody. I'm so pleased to be here with you. Thanks, Priscilla. We're glad to have you. Priscilla Manful is the Manager of Intake Services at the Catholic Children's Aid Society of Toronto. She has worked in child welfare for more than 12 years, holding various frontline and managerial positions. She is currently leading the full-scale implementation of CCAS's Afrocentric wraparound model at the front end of service. Priscilla holds an MSW degree and has background in law. She is interested in how the legal profession, law enforcement, and child welfare can work better together to empower families rather than oppress them. And our last panelist is Vanessa. Vanessa, say hello to our audience. Good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. Vanessa Coco is Chief Social Worker at the Toronto Catholic District School Board. With over 15 years of direct service experience, Vanessa is dedicated to advocacy and well being promotion for children, youth, and families. Vanessa is privileged to work alongside partners in education, child welfare, children's mental health, and school mental health Ontario. So welcome to all our panelists. And throughout the presentation, we encourage you to post your questions to the chat room where Sultan and Saima are monitoring and assembling them for the Q&A portion of our evening. And please note, while we have indicated an end time of 8.30 tonight, we're, we're gonna stay on as long as necessary to have a robust discussion and answer as many questions as possible. So if you can, stay with us. And if you can't, please note that we'll be providing the recording for you to view in the future. Now, I'm gonna introduce you to our co-host for the evening, Dr. Carl James. Um, I have to say uh, that it's been a pleasure to work with Carl over the past decade. And uh, for those of you that don't know, um, Carl almost single-handedly changed the trajectory of database, uh, identity-based data collection in this province. He was the driving force to really push for a provincial policy in identity-based data collection 
that was made a couple of years ago by the Ministry of Education. So um, really he is a giant in educational circles in North America. Carl James holds the Jean Augustine Chair in Education, Community and Diaspora at York University, where he is also Senior Advisor on Equity and Representation. He teaches in the Faculty of Education and in the graduate programs in Sociology and Social and Political Thought, and for several years taught in the Teacher Training Department at Uppsala University in Sweden. His research interests include examination of the schooling experiences, educational performance, employment opportunities, career trajectories, and social achievements of racialized people, particularly Black youth, noting the ways in which societal and institutional cultures shape their lived experiences. He was one of six advisors to the Ontario Minister of Education and Ontario Premier from 2017 to 2018. He's won a plethora of awards and a list of these and his publications is available on the York U website. So if you want to get access to these, please Google Carl James biography. <clears throat> so I'd now like to pass it over to Carl to provide background of how this webinar came to be. Over to you, Carl. Thanks very much, Jack. Thanks very much for having me. Nice being here and it's nice to see this uh, webinar coming to fruition. And I must also, with just as the others have said, thank Dr. Brown for his comments and, and him naming all these things that I've been thinking about with regard to looking at the institutional issues within the board, the fact that you're thinking of data and its use and how useful it might be and how that might be implemented the board, uh, human rights policy, the whole notion of how uniforms might be a violation or a factor in students' experiences when it comes to the access to education and participating in education, all those things I thought You've covered just about everything, Dr. Brown. I'm hoping that we can be resourceful and support you as you do these things, because we know that these are huge tasks, especially in trying to implement them. So thanks again. I'm looking forward to, to more and ex, uh, of these kind of things. And of course, to, to allow the board to set the agenda for others who might follow, especially other Catholic boards. So we appreciate what you've done and what you're planning to do in that report, in your work there. Uh, tonight's uh, uh, program uh, has a lot to do with Kate Shoemaker's uh, uh, and my meeting sometime last fall, early spring, where we were invited by the Ministry of Social Services uh, within the last year to discuss issues related to uh, racialized students, racialized youth, and, and what's happening with them as we think of them in social services. <clears throat> and we had a very, very good discussion at the ministry that day. And at that time, Kate shared much of the research that she'd been doing. And, and of course, it's much of the research that the Catholic board has been doing. And I thought, Brilliant, that's excellent. We need to know more of these things. And the, the uh, Faculty of Education Summer Institute, I thought would be a fantastic place to invite Kate to come and talk about the work that she's been doing, especially how it intersects with what goes on with students and racialized students and blacks and indigenous students in this meantime in the, in the board. <clears throat> so, all credit uh, tonight, and I must say, uh, Kate, for giving me insights into some of the things that's happening with young people as they navigate their way through this school system and the role of the Catholic Children's Aid Society in enabling, supporting, and in some cases, having to challenge some of the issues that we are going to be talking about tonight. So thanks very much, Kate. And I think it's over to you now to help us engage in that very productive discussion. 
So thanks again for making it all possible. I really appreciate this. Thank you very much, Carl. And uh, it's true. Um, I'd love to have a more exciting story, perhaps, than meeting you at a, at a ministry meeting, with all due respect to ministry <laughs> meetings, because I once worked there, and I still love policy. Um, but we did have a wonderful meeting that day. There were many others in attendance. But one of the things I learned about Carl that day is that his remarks in that larger group were judicious but meaningful. And so I actually learned that day, Carl, that when you speak, people, people listen. And I did tell you, Carl, on a break about some of the work that we've been doing and the analyses that had implications, I thought, for educators as one of our primary referral sources. And so, in fact, um, most people don't really want to talk to me a lot about data, uh, but Carl agreed to meet again a couple of weeks later. And so we met at U of T and I brought a couple of friends and, and one of him is Priscilla, who's going to present tonight with me. And so this invite, of course, as Carl says, led to this partnership. And it's so, it's so much our privilege to have this opportunity to share with you and to engage in the conversation together. Um, I am going to talk to you about the data that, that Carl was so taken with. But uh, before I do that, I'm going to, um, I'm actually going to turn things over to my great colleague, Carol Way, to kick us off. Because our journey towards becoming an anti-racist and anti-oppressive organization absolutely did not start with the kind of fancy graphs and pictograms that I brought with me today. And it certainly didn't start with me. It started much, much earlier as Carol will speak to. And the analysis that I'll share in a little bit um, really only came into being and had the support and the resourcing as a result of these early efforts and the courageous people who really paved the way and fought to be heard and fought to make identity-based data, race-based data collection and analysis, and the actions that followed an organizational priority. So Carol, I'm going to turn things over to you to get us started on that journey. Thank you, Kate. Good evening, everyone. I'm happy to be here to share uh, with my colleague to share our anti-racism, anti-oppressive journey at Catholic Children's Aid Society of Toronto. I'm going to refer to it moving forward as TCAS. Our journey continues, and it is our hope that sharing our story will give you encouragement to start or continue your own journey to address all forms of oppression and anti-Black racism. I can tell you that this journey is not easy, but for ourselves, our young people, and families that we work with, in order to address systemic racism, we have no choice to, to be on this journey. I will be sharing the journey of, the, of CCS and our path to create an environment where anti-oppressive and anti-racism lens are embedded in the everyday practice of the agency. Next slide. I like spending my vacation on road trips. On my road trips, I encountered all types of roads and at times some adversity. The bumpy roads that forces me to drive slowly and carefully the crossroads that force me to pick a direction to go, the dead ends that forces me to stop, think, and retrace my roots to understand where I made the wrong turn. And sometimes I even experience a traffic jam that forces me to idle for what seems like a lifetime. Because I love road trips, I'm going to use this analogy to share CCS journey to addressing racism, especially anti-Black racism. Next slide, please. Our journey has started many decades ago. There were many initiatives started to address anti-oppressive practices, but these initiatives slowly disintegrated. This has had a profound impact for staff within the organization, and they often questioned the commitment of the agency to address racism. Over the years, the conversation about race has come to many different crossroads. And from staff perspective, it appears that when the conversation became difficult, the leaders of the organization is unsure as to how to address these issues. And the work of the agency continues. However, the conversation about race and specifically anti-Black racism remains idling in the background. As such, staff felt they were not supported and they had a difficult time trusting management. This created a climate of mistrust, both by some staff and some clients of the agency. Over the years, our clients and staff has raised issues around racism. 
And while some were addressed, there was no holistic approach of how to address systemic racism. It also became clear that there was a lack of consistency when issues of racism arose. There was feeling of a stopgap measures that were taken but not fully addressed the holistic problem of racism within our organization. Next slide, please. What was, what was evident was individual issues were addressed as they rose. And what we learned is that the journey of being an anti-oppressive and anti-racism agency is an ongoing process. It never ends. It's a journey of, of improvement. It does not stop when one issues of racism are addressed, when issues of racism are addressed in, um, individually. I just wanna pause here and note that the road travel was not excuse, exclusive to CCAS. Many organizations have been on this road and some is currently on this road addressing the bumps in terms of addressing anti-Black racism. Now back to CCS journey. Staff and clients would share their personal stories, but their stories were often treated as one-off um, incidents. And I would be bold to say that there was denial of racism existing within the agency, despite the many stories by our clients, staff, and the community. Anecdotal experiences and stories were not as valued at this time as the society did not have the data to support the stories. This issue was not only within the Catholic Children's Aid Society, but within the entire child welfare sector. The child welfare sector did not collect race database. I remember years ago, and I won't tell you what, what year it was because I don't want anyone to try and distract from this conversation by trying to guess my age. But I remember years ago when I was completing my research for my master's of social work degree, I contacted the Ontario Association of Children's Aid to get some data on race. And I was surprised when I was dismissed and told that the child welfare does not collect this type of data. Next slide, please. This, however, changed around 2014, 2013, 24, when the Toronto Star published their research with such headlines, why are so many black children in foster and group home? Child welfare system is rigged against black families and black kids stay longer in care. Thanks to the Toronto Star research, the child welfare sector started collecting it data and the collection of data support all the years of anecdotal stories about racism within the sector. Next slide, please. When you consider that research shows that there are no significant differences in the overall incidence of child maltreatment between white folks and the people of African descent. However, professionals and individuals are more likely to report people of African descent than white folks to the child welfare system. Sit with that for a moment. There's no difference between maltreatment between white folks and, and people of African descent, but professionals and individuals are more likely to refer black families to the child welfare system than their white, than white families. Sit with that. This only leaves us with one explanation and shows why in order to address the issues, we need to be comfortable with naming anti-black racism. In 2015, Ontario Association of Child Welfare, Ch sorry, Ontario Associated Children's Aid, which I'm gonna to refer to as OASCS moving forward, responded to the STARS article and to the Black community by creating a one vision, one race, 11 equity practices for child welfare, which includes such thing as committing, commitment to courageous leadership, collecting and analyzing data to measure disproportionality and disparity, and in engaging African Canadian parents, parents and communities. At CCAS, we completed our own deep dive into data, which my colleague Kate will share with you in a moment. And we hired a diversity and inclusion consultant that met with most staff in the organization and completed facilitated discussion groups. Through ongoing conversation and dialogue, learning began and thus supporting the beginning of organizational change. These discussion has had a powerful impact on all staff and foster parents. These discussions were at times tough and had some people in tears. 
These discussions were also met with denial of racism in the organization. It was met with questions about why are we only focusing on black families and that infamous saying that all families matter. This, however, did not distract us from the work at hand as the data and stories of people experiences highlighted the impact of systemic racism. Next slide, please. There is a disproportionate, disproportionate number of black youth in the care of CCAS. In order to understand this disproportionality, we have to take a deep look at the colonial practices which views family using a, its Eurocentric lens. We need to look at the colonial structures, how policies and procedures are drafted, how our court systems and educational system are structured, and we need to name racism and anti-Black racism. In short, the need to understand the lived experience of Black families and the impact of racism on their everyday lives and parenting. And we need to understand that racism is a form of trauma and has significant impact on families' physical and mental health. Sit with that. Racism is a form of trauma and has significant impact on families' physical and mental health. Next slide, please. On this part of our journey, CCS with our executive director back in 2015, who not only acknowledged that anti-Black racism exists, but put resources forward to addressing racism. Through this strong leadership, the agency was able to hire an ARAO lead who facilitated training and provided ongoing consultation to staff. The agency also worked collaboratively with OACS and have committed to ensure that all 11 equity practices, which I shared some with you, are implemented in the organization. And we here at CCS have created an ARAO blueprint. We also have an ARAO steering committee made up of staff from all departments of the agency to hold us accountable in our implementation. We are also providing ongoing opportunities to staff through many different activities within the agency. We're looking at equity practices throughout the entire agency. Our current executive director is very forward thinking and action oriented. Our senior management team is very committed and have dedicated weekly meetings only for ARAO discussions. Our managers and supervisors have regular discussions with the team. We started collecting identity-based data to understand the services that we are providing to our community. We piloted an Afrocentric wraparound program, which my colleague Priscilla will share with you in a moment. Next slide, please. Our journey, we experienced a bumpy ride as there was climate of mistress at time. There was a fear of speaking out up as people were scared of saying the wrong things or people were scared of being seen as troublemakers. On our journey at times, there were many blind spots as there was lack of awareness about the black experience and culture thus creating oppressive practices which led to overrepresentation. Next slide, please. Our journey, Next slide, please. Our journey is ongoing. We are providing learning opportunities to staff. We are having open and honest discussion about, about ARAO and anti-Black racism. We're engaging and doing advocacy work with our referral sources, and we're working with different community organization. Next slide. So in terms of the lessons learned, the ARAO work is huge. We need everyone to participate. We have to have more than one person leading. We need a team. We also learn it's okay to be uncomfortable having these discussions. Do not shy away from having these discussions. Let others sit in their own discomfort. It is through this discomfort that learning takes place. And finally, we need to commit to this process. Next slide. The overall lesson is that AR AO and anti-Black racism is a way of being. It's not something you turn off at 3.30, 4.30 or 5 p.m. It is the way one lives their life, thus making the world a better place for everyone you interact with, despite their race, ability, disability, gender, age, and sexual orientation, to name a few. Anti-racism, anti-oppressive practice, and anti-Black racism is a moral way of being. 
Next slide, please. Just before I turn this over to my colleague, Kate, to share her statistical analysis and her data, I'm going to ask you to take a moment and do one simple thing. As you go through and listen to speakers, think of one simple thing you will change or work on in your personal growth and capacity on your ARL and anti-Black racism journey. I want you to choose a colleague that you will follow up with in, a three, months, in three months to share your progress for that one simple thing. Please feel free to share your one simple thing in the chat to give your colleagues some ideas of what that one simple thing can be. So before I turn it over to, um, to Kate, I'm just gonna give you 30 seconds to just, to just process, think through what I just said and think of there's one simple thing. Next slide, please. And I just wanna leave you with this. It's not our differences that divide us. It is our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences. Thank you. And I'll pass it over to Kate. Thank you so much, Carol. And I was I was happy about the 30 seconds you gave to people because it gave me an opportunity to get all of my papers in order here. So um, Carol's remarks are extremely powerful for me as someone who's been part of this journey in the organization. And uh, it's not my time to speak about some of the things that she spoke about in terms of how this has touched me personally, but I, I guess um, suffice it to say for now, that for me, it's become something that is much broader than my job. It is something, as Kara was mentioning, that really has become part of my reflection about how I want to be in this world and how I want to show up, not just at work, but, but everywhere impacting all relationships. Uh, but my job in the organization is uh, to do uh, research and analytics, and um, I manage our quality assurance department, so I have a wonderful team who does that work alongside me. And much of the work I'm gonna share with you tonight also credit needs to go to them. And tonight, what I'd like to talk about is our journey with respect to collecting and analyzing our identity or race-based data uh, with a specific focus on uh, disproportionality and disparity with respect to our Black service users. Uh, next slide. So I always start any conversation about data, and many of the speakers pr prior to me have, have touched on this already, uh, with a reminder that qualitative data actually are data too, and they count too. We have a tendency uh, to privilege what we know from numbers over what we know from people and their lived experiences. But in the beginning, as Carol mentioned, we had information about lived experiences, both from historically disenfranchised groups who've had contact with our system and also from the racialized staff and other advocates who work within our system. And this qualitative information has actually been available for quite some time. And so a question we might ask ourselves just to tuck away to think about is, why were we not listening when we had access to this rich information? Uh, and much more recently in the last few years, and Carl, I didn't realize how involved you were, but there's been an increasing call for numbers and qualitative data are really complemented by what we're starting to see in the quantitative data, as Carol has also said. And quantitative data answer different questions like how many and how much, and they allow us to perform very specific analyses like disproportionality and disparity. Um, but one of the things that I hope that we can get better at is not discounting certain kinds of information out of hand and ensuring that we see both kinds of data, both qualitative and quantitative, as critical and legitimate to both understanding what's happening um, and also to informing our actions as we move forward. Next slide, please. Uh, so here's what we already knew, and I think it's really important to start with what Carol had uh, just briefly referenced, which is in 2016, the Ontario Association of Children's Aid Societies conducted under the banner of their One Vision, One Voice project, um, a consultation across the province with service users of child welfare, staff, other organizations, and young people in and from our care. And they heard from almost 800 people as part of the series of consultations. That's a large number of voices. And here's what they shared. Um, I won't be able to summarize all of it, but the salient point. So they spoke of child welfare as a system that has tended to view the struggles of black families ahistorically. So in other words, absent of its context uh, related to racism, a history of slavery and white supremacy. And so as a system 
um, child welfare has tended to individualize and pathologize the struggles of Black families as though they originate from individual failings alone, rather than having that relationship with years of oppression and marginalization. Um, participants in the consultations also noted biases and racial profiling of other systems that interact with our system, uh, such as education, police, and health, just to name a few. They also talked, and Carol mentioned this uh, in her remarks as well, about the real misfit of a Eurocentric system that really uh, is applied as a one-size-fits-all to families who, of course, come from many different cultures and backgrounds. And a key example of this has been the tendency of the Eurocentric system to see the child sort of in isolation of the family and the community, which, of course, all of you know is at odds with so many other worldviews uh, from different backgrounds and cultures. Uh, our participants also spoke of experiencing many of our policies in child welfare, quite frankly, as racist, and some of our staff too. And they also spoke about our system's tendency to focus on physical safety almost above all else, without any kind of commensurate regard for the social and cultural and spiritual needs of children. What I think was probably most powerful in its simplicity was when young people in and from our care spoke, they essentially said, um, racism is the number one issue. That's pretty sobering. Next slide, please. So at CCAS, on the heels of receiving this um, information through the provincial consultations, we began conducting our own quantitative analysis of our own data. And first we looked at this notion of disproportionality, which really is the degree to which black children are represented in our system at CCAS compared to the representation in the general population. And to conduct this analysis, we actually ordered a customized data set from StatsCan that allowed us to isolate the Catholic child population in Toronto by race so that we could really look at our own decision making rather than having the results modeled up in the decision making of the three other organizations that also serve the Toronto community. So what we found was that although black kids and youth make up about 9% of the Toronto uh, child population, at the Toronto Catholic child population, they made up 31% of the children that we investigated in the particular data set we used. And further, they make up 38% of the children who are in our care. And so that comparison back to their representation of 9% in the Toronto child population shows the degree of disproportionality that we have in our system, initially at the front end, and then carrying on through to who we have uh, in our care. Uh, next slide, please. We also took a look at, at uh, what's called an incidence rate or a rate of investigations per thousand children, again, in the Toronto Catholic child population. And this allowed us to do a comparison between, between our degree of sort of intrusion into uh, the communities that white children live in compared to the communities that black children live in. And what we found there was that the likelihood of being referred and investigated to the Catholic Children's Aid was 400% greater if you are a black Catholic child in Toronto compared to being a white Catholic child. And so that's the difference between 33 per thousand white children are investigated by CCS compared to 133 black children per thousand in the Catholic population in Toronto. Again, these are really sobering stats. We then um, looked at our decision making around removing children from their home, which is probably, and I'm sure I don't have to tell anyone in this audience, uh, the most significant and intrusive decision that we can make. And we found in that analysis that Black children were 28% more likely to be admitted to care compared to their white counterparts. And um, again, I'm sure I don't need to say this to all of you, but admission to care brings with it tremendous loss and trauma associated with separation of children from their families, from their communities. And often, unfortunately in our work, when we're placing children with families, we're not placing within their neighborhoods or communities, and we're often not placing them with people who look like them or share their culture and traditions. So this is something that requires our immediate attention. Next slide, please. This is the last slide of data and thank you for hanging on because like, as I said, not everyone can tolerate uh, lengthy conversations about data. Uh, but we finally conducted an analysis um, that's called a sensitivity and specificity analysis. And we looked specifically at our screening decision, which is the decision to screen a case in once referred to us uh, for an investigation. And sensitivity and specificity is just really a fancy way of analyzing whether when we make a decision to screen in a case, um, we've made the quote unquote right decision. And the right decision was defined as um, screening in a case, investigating and verifying child protection concerns either within that investigation or within 12 months of that investigation. 
And what we found was that of all of our investigations, and this included all children, not just our black children referred, in about 30% of cases, uh, those are the black uh, people figures that you see um, in the pictogram, in about 30% of cases, we investigate a case uh, and we don't verify any child protection concerns at that time, and we don't verify any child protection concerns within the subsequent 12 months. And those cases are called false positives in a sensitivity and specificity analysis. And although false positives occur with all referral sources, everybody who refers to us sometimes refers a case where subsequently we don't verify, that particular analysis showed that false positives are most likely to be those referrals coming from schools. And these are the data that I talked to Carl about when we met. And the rate of false positives for referrals from schools is just over 40%, so higher than the rate in the overall uh, population of investigations. And so I want to be really clear about how we've interpreted these findings. Schools and many of you who are, who are listening to this, you refer to us, and it's our decision to screen a case in. And so what this suggests really is the need for all of us to work together uh, so that our collective response is less likely to put a child and family through an unnecessary and intrusive response like an investigation when what may actually be called for is support. And Vanessa is gonna speak a lot more to this uh, during her remarks. So the upshot of all of this analysis is that when we began looking at our screening data, we had a screened in rate of about just under 90%. And after we finished the analysis and started sharing with people like Priscilla and her team, and she'll speak to this more, our screened in rate has gone down to about 75% of all referrals. And this has been a conscious effort to divert cases away from investigation based on what we learned from these data. Next slide. So that's a lot of numbers, and I hope that everyone was able to follow the general gist of that. Anyone can contact me afterwards for much, much more detail about methods and charts, et cetera, et cetera. But what does all of this mean for our practice, which is the reason why we do this? So first and foremost, I hope that we can conclude that we're actually sitting on a wealth of evidence that we as a child welfare system have not always served Black families well or equitably. And second, we know from our quantitative analysis that disproportionality begins right at the front door. And so we need to work differently, as I was saying, and together with all of our referral sources. Um, and we need to look at our own decision making about what we do and who we screen in for investigation. So clearly this calls for better collaboration and understanding with our partners, especially you in education and police, because over half of our referrals come from these two sectors. And Priscilla is going to speak a lot more to this uh, when she speaks. And finally, the data on admissions around disparity and, and the likelihood of being admitted, being elevated for our black children is most critical for our own system to own in child welfare. Because as I said, it's the most intrusive decision that we make and has the greatest consequences for children, their families and their communities. And one thing I can share with you is since we started collecting race-based data, taking a look at our admissions by race, we've actually reduced our admissions to care over the last three to four years by more than 50%. And so I can't stress this last piece enough is that one of the biggest learnings has been that by focusing on making the system better for marginalized groups, and in this case for our black community, we actually make the system better for all families. Next slide. So finally, I wanna share quickly, um, just a few lessons learned uh, about data itself. Um, for those of you who are collecting data, who want to collect data, who are in the process of analyzing race-based data, it's been a struggle. And I think it's important to be transparent with each other about that. Um, and the data completeness and accuracy of the data is actually an issue that we're working um, quite hard on and takes a lot of time and energy and resources. Our staff are sometimes very uncomfortable engaging in conversations about race with our service users. Um, and they're also uncomfortable engaging in these conversations at times with referral sources. And some of you I imagine are uncomfortable when we ask you these questions when you call us. And so this can lead to incomplete data. And incomplete data is a real problem for, for the researchers among you and the analysts because incomplete data um, skews your results. Uh, we learned too that this, this discomfort that sometimes people feel leads them to not engage our service users in conversations about identity. And so we have data that don't necessarily represent self-identification, which is best practice when it comes to using uh, and collecting race-based uh, or identity-based data. And so this hesitancy to not engage in these conversations has an impact on the quality of our data as well. And so we, need, we know we need to work on this too. 
we definitely need better tools to be able to routinely access our data, extract it from our system so that we can analyze it in a timely way, uh, not just to keep me and my staff busy, but so that we can share it back with staff and our partners as well to see and monitor how we're doing. Um, definitely this next point is uh, hopefully been stressed throughout the presentation. We need to continue to value qualitative data from our service users and from the black communities we serve. We need to definitely put in, in place better processes that more routinely ask for that qualitative feedback about how we're doing. Because the best way to answer the question of whether or not things are getting better for black families in child welfare is to ask them. And finally, we need our data to inform action. And this has been mentioned by a number of speakers and I'm delighted to hear that because in my experience um, doing research and data analysis for many years, um, a lot of the analysis is designed to document inequities rather than to address them or change them. And so what we know from what I've just shared with you can't sit on the shelf. Analysis is only helpful if it leads to meaningful action for change. So this is a wonderful segue to turn things over to Priscilla because Priscilla is actually gonna talk about some of the actions that we either uh, have started or are planning to engage in. And I wanna really thank everybody for being part of this conversation with us and this journey with us. Um, I truly look forward to further conversations with many of you. And Priscilla, on that note, over to you. Thank you, Kate. Um, so anti-racism and anti-oppression in action. Um, so I manage the CCS's intake department, and this is the department that referral sources first engage with when they first call into organization to report or share uh, concerns about a child or youth or family. And um, I will be walking you through how we have strived to provide a differential response service to our African descent children and youth and their families through a model known as the Afrocentric Wraparound, ACW for short. Next slide, please. We have highlighted at CCA as the need to embed ARAO practices and principles at all levels of the organization as a key strategic objective. And as a critical step for us at CCAS, we've made it a priority to investigate and address the factors within our control that contribute to this issue from a policy and procedural barriers to anti-Black bias and discrimination. And our goal is to deliver service through an anti-racist, anti-oppression lens, trauma-informed lens, and also evidence-informed lens. Next slide, please. We acknowledge um, the fact that it can be overwhelming and worrisome for some to call us, especially when you don't know what to expect when you do. The key here is to provide as much information as you can, and the screener or the intake worker will engage you through all the processes and will also advise you what next steps will look like. Next step, next slide, please. In determining the best response based on the information that has been uh, shared with us and analyzed, the worker in consultation with their supervisor will disposition the information that you have provided in a variety of ways. Uh, it could be that uh, we make a decision to have no contact with the family. We may only document the information that you have shared with us. We could also provide a brief non-protection service by connecting the family to a community resource which is known as a community lens. Um, and then we can also uh, determine to uh, initiate a full-blown child investigation. To Kate's point, we do take our data very, very seriously. And so we have deliberately made efforts to increase our community link services instead of commencing child protection investigation, depending on the information that is shared with us then through um, further analysis. In terms of how we determine uh, our response time, it all depends on a variety of information. We're looking at the information presented to us, the child safety and, uh, and what have you. And then we determine whether to customize our approach and we reserve the traditional approach for a more serious type of investigations and at times where we involve the police to initiate what we call um, a joint investigation. Next slide, please. The Afrocentric wraparound strategy was piloted by uh, Catholic Children's Society CCAS as one component of the broader One, uh, one Vision, One Voice OVOV program, which was funded through the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services, and also through the Ontario Association of Children's Aid Societies. So OVOV, which is the One Vision, One Voice, seeks 
to address the long-standing overrepresentation and experiences of disparities faced by African Canadians after contact with the child welfare system in Ontario. The goal of ACW or the Afrocentric Craft Around, therefore, is to reroute child welfare work upon any contact with African Canadian children, youth, and families, and to build on African Canadian community-based care in child welfare work. And we are also working to ensure that the least intrusive approach is maintained. Therefore, this model serves as a guide in that regard. And the ACW model uh, includes the following elements, as you can see now. Um, it has the critical decision-making model, an assortment of tools for frontline workers and supervisors that are integral to countering individual and systemic biases, the collection of uh, cultural genogram data for each family that, that is served, and also referrals for service users to Afrocentric community services. Next slide, please. Before I get into it, I want to sound a caution that all is not rosy and dandy in organization. And as Carol mentioned, we are on a journey and everyone in organization has had a different path on this journey. And so we do have our own individual struggles and challenges. However, we are making every effort to bring everyone along this journey with us and make effort in utilizing the critical decision-making model. When used at the screening and investigation level, the critical decision-making model uh, seeks to answer seven critical questions, which are listed in the next two slides. Um, what are the city child protection concerns? What are the assumptions? What are the child protection concerns after the assumptions have been unpacked? What is working? What is already working? Or what is not working? What needs to happen next? And then how can we support? The, the critical decision-making model uh, is used at each decision-making point for every African Canadian child, youth, and family. And it is based on practice wisdom, which is ever evolving and also evidence-informed. And it intends to assist us in achieving thorough non-biased uh, decision-making by helping us slow the process down and critically question our judgments. And this model um, includes various practice framework initiatives by the province and also reflects the Child Youth Family Services Act by promoting an integrative child welfare practice approach. When we look at what are the city child protection concerns, which is the first asked question, this is all the information that the referral source shares with the intake worker or the screener. The second question then is what are the assumptions that is determined from the first question, which is the, refer the information that is shared. How do we know what we know? And have we critically revealed the child welfare history we have of the family, that is if we have any? And we're also looking at what the potential false narratives are. We're looking at what is factual. And for us to ascertain this, we will ask for clarification. An example is where, um, um, not, re not too recent or very recently, we did have a five-year-old senior kindergarten child who presented with a significant injury on her finger. And um, when asked about the injury, she said her father did it and then she made a sound. The teacher who reported this was very emotional when she described the child as a very sweet little bunny, and describe the stepfather as this big burly black man with dreadlocks and tattoos. When we asked the teacher to engage with a child about how she sustained the injury, the teacher was not comfortable. And so we reached out to the principal who then spoke to the child. According to the, uh, the principal in this child's eloquence, she described that her father accidentally closed the door on her finger. He was very sorry about this, brought her to the doctor and her finger was stitched. In the past, not only would we be opening a protection file and ascribing a serious child abuse code, we will also be contacting the police to initiate a joint investigation. However, by asking further clarifying questions, we were able to determine that there wasn't any role for child welfare in this situation and we directed the school to follow up with the family. So um, we use anti-oppression, anti-racism and anti-black racism to ask about context, about power relations and identities, and also look at how might trauma be impacting the situation. 
And when we look at trauma, we are looking at the individual trauma. We are also looking at the system's trauma, including our own trauma, and asking as to whether we are listening and speaking differently based on the identities involved. We are also looking at what barriers might be involved with what is being presented to us, whether it's lack of access, whether it's racism in the schools, amongst other things. The third question is, what are the child protection concerns? And so after the assumptions have all been uncovered, we look at what then is left in terms of behaviors, um, resources, and then networks. Uh, we're also looking at um, safety. How is safety being discussed? Because it's very critical that we need to be careful of racist ideas, which are then guised as safety. So in the example that I shared, we have a, a child who is described as sweet little bunny, and then her stepfather is described as huge, black, burly, with tattoos, with dreadlocks. And, and, and so we are, what the picture that's being painted for us is a, a, a man who is, um, how do I put it, who is dangerous, so to speak, let's put it bluntly. And so that is what is worrying the referral source, and that is what is being projected to us. So when we have been describing safety, we are being very cautious in what is being presented to us, how we are unpacking that, and then looking at what is underneath what is being presented to us. And we ask ourselves as to what are we most concerned about and how concerned should we be? The fourth question, uh, next slide, is what is not working? Here, we are looking at the risk factors that are being presented. And I wanna say that there is a level of risk for all families, including all of ours on this call today. And so what is different about the, um, what is different about this identified family? And we assess the presented risk by naming it. I don't wanna hear people say that my gut feelings is this, I feel like, no. Whatever your opinions are, should be based on fact and we need to name it because that is how we can begin to even dismantle some of our thought processes. And we are looking at whether there are any identified systemic barriers, including housing, racism, language, food insecurity, uh, precarious immigration status. And then we're looking at how have we understood our practice in relation to the differences of identity, power, and then culture. The next question we then ask is what is already working? Here, we use a trauma-informed perspective to look for protective factors. And then we want to build on what we think um, we know is already working in terms of resources, family strength, and their supports. And then the sixth question is, um, what needs to happen next? Here, we're looking at what can reduce the concerns? And how can we bring the family, the community, and services that they're already involved into a to the decision-making table? And how can we increase space for service user influence and increase collaborative planning? And then we go to our final question, how can we support? Uh, before I even get into that, I wanna say that only 15% of our referrals in fact constitute urgent protection matters. So when I say urgent protection matters, what I mean is where a child has sustained injuries, uh, I'm talking about severe child abuse cases, which means that 85% of our referrals fall under chronic needs, uh, which means that families are in fact in need of service and not in need of protection. And so at the investigation level, we know that it's very crucial to involve the family in making decisions. Uh, we recognize that it can be overwhelming to be involved with a powerful system like ours, and so it is important to share that power. And we recognize that our families are experts of their own situations and they have values and they have preferences. At CCAS, we have what we call the family-centered conference model, which is FCC, and it's based on the premise of transparency. Nothing about me without me. What that means is that we will not make a decision about a black family without them at the table. This primarily involves the family and who they consider as their supports, such as friends, neighbors, faith communities, and what have you, also including community resources that they are engaged in and the child welfare service team. When we come together, we are all equal participants at that table. And the approach is tailored to provide a culturally identity responsive service delivery 
as well as addressing intersectionality. In this conference, it is crucial that the child and family's voices are amplified and heard, and decisions are made collaboratively and also is family driven. So that is how it sort of works in a nutshell. Next slide, please. This circle here for me is for you to reflect on. It's an adaptation from Etherington and Baker. And it's for you to understand the unique experiences of all involved in relation to their distinct historical and current context, power relations and identities. So you have in the very middle, uh, the, the very center, the child, the family and the, and the youth. And the first circle or circle one includes the systems or ideologies which may affect an individual. Circle two includes the forms of discrimination and social, I mean, um, uh, vices if I may. And then the third circle includes identity characteristics of an individual. Next slide, please. The identity genogram example for us at CCS, we believe that it takes a village to raise a child. Therefore, this visual genogram provides us with the opportunity to figure out who is in the child's life and the role they play or can play if needed. Next slide, please. The kin and kid community support table. Here, we identify the numerous supports of who is also involved in the child life and potential alternate caregivers we can connect with if, they, if the child can no longer remain safely in their home. So as we engage in at the front end, we are already identifying um, outside of number one, we look at number two, number three, in the event that a child will have to um, experience a placement change or a home change, who can they go to so that we can engage those individuals right away? Next slide, please. Uh, before I get into the next steps, I wanna say that due to these changes, I will admit, and acknowledge that some referral sources, especially from our educational community, get frustrated with us. Their experience when they call us is different from their previous experiences. Some have in fact questioned whether to call us because they believe CCAS won't do anything and ask them to do the work. So why bother calling us? I want to say that our decision to not open a protection file is by intention and not negligence, and is based on the assessment of the information that is provided based on all of the seven questions that I've sort of walked you through. We've also realized that at times, we do, when you don't like the responses that you get, the reporting issues are either magnified in order to warrant a protection investigation or you call another child welfare agency or call after our service and provide slightly different information where a file is then started. I need you to reflect on this action and the impact on a family when after the so-called investigation is completed, the allegations aren't substantiated, which then increases our false positives that Kate shared. Wouldn't you rather want to engage in the discussion and challenge some of the assumptions that we all hold? The other piece, also is that many educational staff um, nowadays call us and wish to remain anonymous and refuse to provide us with their contact information. They only identify the school they're calling from. And although this is allowed under the law or is permitted under the law, it presents us with challenges when we need to connect back to the referral source for follow-up questions. So think about why as the mandated referral source or as a mandated professional, you wish to remain anonymous, uh, especially when you engage with that child on a regular basis. Um, and you also know that when we become involved and the child is engaged, the parent is gonna ask the child who they have spoken to. So at some point, your identity will be revealed. I mean, will be revealed. So wouldn't it be very helpful that we engage in the dialogue and unpack all the issues and then look at what then is remaining so that may constitute a differential approach as to how we disposition that information. At times to when we have asked for further clarifying information about a child or family, we sometimes hit roadblocks. Where the referral person would tell us that they are late for a class or the in-between classes and cannot get the information. And when we have openly asked if the child is a black student, it sometimes put the referral person on the defense with comments such as, 
I don't see color. I, I treat everyone the same. Do you think I'm racist? And then you sometimes want to speak to a supervisor and at times it escalates to a manager. I add that as partners, we need to engage in the conversation and challenge each other. Ask all the questions that you have, but please be open-minded to hearing the worker out. I mean, after all, we all want one thing, which is child safety and child well-being. Opening a child in, I mean, welfare investigation on a family is a very big deal. And we want to ensure that we have enough information to formulate an assessment prior to doing so. Um, we have already partnered with several community resources to wrap services around families towards positive family functioning and also admission prevention. But there is also, however, a greater need for us to continue to seek out helpful services, especially from the Black community towards this end. And I guess for myself, I think there is also a greater need for us to collaborate or for a greater need for collaboration with the many systems that the child, youth, and family may become involved with including not only the child welfare system, but also the educational system, justice system, police system, health system, et cetera. Uh, and it is critical to look at all the intersectionality of these systems, our unique roles, enhance our existing protocols and policies to have a holistic response and support to our service recipients that is grounded in AIO and ABR or anti-Black um, racism um, lenses. When our respective policies collude with each other, it can be very frustrating for families to navigate when they are pulled in different directions. An example is you may have a parent who is before the criminal justice system with a set of conditions, and at the same time before the um, family court system with a different set of um, conditions. And um, the identified child might experience challenges in assessing or receiving the needed mental health support if they continue to reside with identified offender uh, due to um, policies, because some mental health practitioners have expressed that for them to provide um, resource to an identified child, that child should not be living with identified offender without necessarily even having the context. And so, in as much as we work together, I see that we sometimes work in silos and it's always very frustrating for our service recipients. And we need to begin to reflect on how our services intersect and how we can actually use uh, our services for educational and teachable opportunities and moments instead of being punitive. Next slide, please. You need to report, I think um, enough have been said about this already. And all that I wanted to add here is Together, we have a collective responsibility to Ontario's children and youth. And so we appreciate the collaboration with our educational partners. Uh, and as professionals who work with children, you're duty bound um, to report any suspected child protection concerns to your local child welfare organization. What I wanna say is that we want you to continue to refer to us. We want you to call us for consultations. However, please know that you may encounter some very different questions that you have been used to. We will engage in a dialogue with you and maybe we will be asking you to provide support before calling us back to tell us how it's going and if you still feel child protection is warranted. And through these interactions, we will support children getting their needs met by someone and also educate and learn together. Building and achieving a more inclusive and equitable organizations and uh, institutions, of course, requires ongoing commitment that have already been mentioned by Kate and Carol. We know that oppressions and barriers don't disappear just because we've thought about them. Therefore, we need to be committed to not only naming systemic racism and oppression, but to be dedicated to dismantling them. And so I encourage all of us to act now by striving to become the agent of change that we hope to see. We must challenge to change um, ourselves, we must build awareness to help change our attitudes, and we must get motivated for change for ourselves and for others. Thank you for having me this evening, and I'll turn it over to Vanessa Coco. Thank you, Priscilla. Um, just amazing. I was listening so intently to you. I even forgot I was presenting, so uh, thank you for that. Good evening, everyone. I want to begin by thanking my co-presenters for inviting me to this very important event. 
I also want to thank Director Brown and, of course, the TCDSB Social Work Department for supporting this work every day. Despite the challenges inherent in this critical process, it is my privilege to collaborate with all of you. Uh, next slide, please. This quote is uh, taken from the Ministry of Education's Equity Action Plan, and it sets out the intention in education to ensure that every student has the opportunity to succeed personally and academically, regardless of their background, identity, or personal circumstances. Next slide, please. Now, despite this intention, um, as you can see from the slide, there is data to show that more is needed to reach this expectation. Um, this slide here is taken from the Ministry's Professional Development on Anti-Black Racism. And you can see that there is significant overrepresentation of Black students in special education, safe schools, and school disengagement. Although this specific data comes from TDSB, the numbers are likely comparable in other school boards throughout Ontario. And, you know, I think specifically about our 20 behavior programs in the TCDSB, where at least 90% of the children attending are from racialized backgrounds. The need for systemic transformation is glaringly obvious. Next slide, please. So at the TCDSB, we have a number of structures and policies that strive to adhere to the equity goal established by the ministry. Our equity and inclusive education strategy is based on four pillars school and classroom practices, leadership governance and human resource practices, data collection, integration and reporting, and organization culture change in a Catholic learning community. We also gear intentional supports and opportunities to our Equity Poverty Action Network schools to mitigate risks around poverty in some of the city's identified areas. We work with a number of advisory committees, and I just wanna to stress tonight that this is one open invitation to them to continue speaking on these critical issues. We know and appreciate strongly the need to involve and hear from the community directly to improve our strategies and supports. And of course, this last point here, the amazing group of social workers I'm so fortunate to work with have identified trauma-informed practice, anti-Black racism and equity and inclusion as pillars in our professional development this year. And we hope to use this learning to share with the TCDSB system to build capacity throughout. Next slide, please. So I put up a few points here to demonstrate that despite all of our policies, procedures, and commitments, there are real ways that we can influence change, increase support, and improve outcomes in our everyday work on the front lines in education. For example, when we have our interdisciplinary team meetings to discuss students experiencing challenges, who do we invite to the table? When we hear that a parent is bringing an advocate, do we respond with thanks for the insight that person may bring or defensiveness that we will somehow be called out? How about discipline, about uniform conformity? Do we inquire as to what might be going on in terms of a student's identity or a family's ability to absorb the cost of a uniform? Do we even reflect or ask these questions? When we speak to students and families about our attendance mandate, do we ask with an offer to help or is our language centered on judgment, not realizing that we all do not begin from the same place? During the board closure um, last March due to COVID, my staff received several inquiries and sometimes even requests to engage child welfare when students were not logging into their Google Classroom enough or returning teachers' calls. Whenever those concerns came across my desk, I was always very transparent that if anyone was calling children's aid because a family was struggling to keep their attention online, or engage effectively, then they should also be calling on me and my family as those experiences resonated personally. Next slide, please. The TCDSB has a rigorous mandate to ensure that all employees understand and are aware of their legal duty to report suspected child abuse. Annually, staff are asked to sign off that they have reviewed our policy. In addition, the social work staff offer, offer presentations to school staff and consistently consult on cases. As Priscilla mentioned, we are sometimes asked to further assess and provide support to callers making referrals to Children's Aid. Although I'll be clear, we would never deter anyone from making the call. What we want to ensure is that we have enough information and that we've thought about it enough to decipher that the case meets criteria as laid out in our policy. Now, when making the call, I know it's not an easy decision. 
In education, our students are children and the care with which we interact with them is the most important part of the job. Our duties are entrenched in the values of service, love and patience. And so yes, even when we do need to make a report, we need to do so with that same focus of service and compassion. We always encourage school board staff to consult when there is a concern and not to be afraid of answering follow-up questions for the society. We know our families best, and if we are genuinely concerned, then we need to be part of that team that identifies what the risks are and supports the intervention needed. The partnership is now the focus, as opposed to simply passing the baton to child welfare to investigate. We never want our educators to feel alone in making the call. And so that's why now more than ever, we are offering support and working in collaboration. You know, in the past couple of weeks alone, it has been so powerful to pick up the phone and call Priscilla and say, okay, we have this case that your staff spoke to my staff about. Here's what didn't go right about that on our end. How can we both work with our respective teams and with each other to get this headed in the right direction for the family in need? Our work in silos needs to end not only to enhance the quality of our own work, but most importantly, to have our students and families see us involving them directly in regards to their own well-being. In my humble opinion, to make sure we're not making calls to child welfare out of negative judgment, bias, or fear, we need to see making the call as both a duty to report, but more critically, a duty to support. When I am calling because I see a child in dirty clothes and no lunch, I am calling because I'm wanting to support a family who may be experiencing poverty or housing insecurity, as opposed to punishing a parent who is likely just trying their best. Now, let us not deny that there are cases of significant abuse and malice. However, we know by hearing the stats that Kate has shared that we cannot deny that we are referring a high number of cases that need something, but not quite the intrusive and potentially traumatizing process of a child abuse investigation. I think of an example that highlighted this very point so clearly. It also taught me how valuable it is to learn from our racialized staff and as a leader to look to them for insight and honest feedback about our practices. So we had two students in our system who lost their mother to COVID-19. One child was identified with special needs. The school was deeply concerned for the well-being of these children as no family members engaged with school staff and as mom was the sole provider, the school was now worried about the children being with their biological father who had now entered Canada from another country after years apart. Following some consultation with many different staff, the school involved social work as the next step seemed to be to involve child welfare. So, um, so the, the school wanted to call children's aid to formally confirm dad as a guardian um, and also to call police to attend the home for a wellness check, which is common sometimes. So uh, two of my social workers, one from either of these children's school, um, offered, uh, came to me and said, Vanessa, we have plan B. They offered to work with the school and children's aid to ensure that paperwork around guardianship was in place. And they offered to attend the home to bring messages of support to two young children who so suddenly found themselves without their only advocate and support in the middle of a pandemic. Now imagine for a moment you're at home, a child, sad and, sad and alone after the death of your mother and two social workers who might even look like you show up at the door to say, hey, we're thinking about you and we want you to know that when you're ready, we will be here. Now imagine those same grieving children home alone, hearing a knock at the door and seeing two uniformed police officers now, I don't question the police's best intentions here either, but the impactful de decision and difference of those two scenarios is chilling. And it honestly forever changed me as a clinician, a leader, and a human being. We must slow down, think, consult, and think again to ensure that our actions align with our policies, ethics, and goal of service and education. Next slide, please. So I remember when Kate, Priscilla, and their amazing colleagues came to speak to the social workers in early 2019. I remember feeling a bit nervous about the data I knew Kate was planning to share. There was this mix of defensiveness and concern that we were making mistakes. It was a challenging discussion that was so necessary. As I mentioned, 
I have the privilege of working with elite social work clinicians who know our communities and show up every day to serve them with tireless energy. And as we know, even the most educated and well-intentioned can still grow, learn, and reflect on their own identity, bias, and interventions. Our work as social workers is incredibly personal as we guide and support another on their own unique journey. We can't possibly do this work for others if we do not first look within and acknowledge what is and what isn't. I'm so excited to continue this reflective practice and commitment to growth around issues of equity, racism, and trauma. It was this critical meeting with CCAS that began our work in understanding how we can be more than just referral sources. We can be essential supports in education to allow a student to reach their full potential in all areas. We can fulfill a duty to support by coming from a curious place of wanting to serve and lead the system and ensuring that our calls to child welfare are collaborative and complete with enhanced communication. Next slide, please. So the only way to close is to leave the discussion open and undone. We know this is a marathon that will outlast us all. My hope lies in evenings such as these and the invitation to continue to partner is ongoing and open to all, most especially to our students and families. You know, I remember as a new social worker, eager, out of graduate school, ready to serve, I would sometimes get asked by parents if I was a mother. And at the time, not being one, I would always feel upset by that inquiry. I would say, you know, what does it matter? I'm a great person. I'm nice. I really care. And I knew my stuff. I wanted to help. It was only when I became a mother that I truly understood what that question meant. There was no way I could ever have imagined the intimacy of that role, the depth to which parenting pulls you apart in such specific and wonderful ways. In a similar way, I acknowledge that I can never know what it is like to be a Black woman or a person of color. I want to honor the families that we serve by apologizing for the ways in which we sometimes think our titles, our kindness, and our intentions are enough. And I want to be clear that our commitment to listen, to learn, and to change is now the focus. So finally, as our presentation comes to an end, a reminder, as Carol mentioned, to point out something tonight that resonated with you and make that intention and goal to identify for yourself where you can change, what you wish to learn, and how you will grow. Thank you. So uh, I just would like to thank everybody, uh, thank our esteemed panelists uh, for this invaluable learning and their, the time that they've taken to speak to and, and with us um, in this very unique situation where it has to be a one directional conversation, but clearly there needs to be a reciprocated conversation that's happening, but in social distance context, it's it's quite hard. So um, I'd like to put it out there on behalf of myself and Saima to um, Keep the conversation going. We have the hashtag Fessy 2020, uh, uh, the hashtag Fessy 2020 that we can utilize in uh, in Twitter and, and continue to have a um, a conversation that is it, it's you know it's it's critical, it's necessary to have, and it also speaks to what the spirit of this this session really was about. Was that yes, this is the data, and this data we you know are privileging quantitative or qualitative that needs to change and this data needs to be enacted on quickly and um, it no longer needs to be uh, a journey that one day we'll arrive to that hopefully we just arrive there at that moment so please have a conversation on twitter um, and our, our panelists will be following the hashtag as well and you know let's keep this going um, so with that said, uh, there's a lot to take away from today. I highly encourage everyone before you hit up even Twitter, rewatch the review the recording, watch the recording again. For those of you who registered, we will be sending you a recording uh, of this session. So please do um, review some of the pieces that were covered. Um, and yeah, let's 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 have a conversation via Twitter. So uh, as I was saying, um, this recording will be sent to you, but it will also be housed on our FESI site. Um, which is fessy.blog.yorku.ca. Our next webinar 
uh, in preparation for the next one. Our next one is November 25th, and it is on decolonizing mental health. And it will be with Dr. Jennifer Mullen and Cheryl Woolna. Uh, we will have the information for registering closer to the event, which again is November 25th. So generally two weeks preceding that, we will uh, send out a batch email and have you register. Um, so please keep an eye out for that announcement. And lastly, on behalf of Saima and I, uh, the organizing committee and our esteemed advisors, uh, Dr. Carl James, Jack Negro, and Vidya Shah, thank you everyone for hanging in there for an extra half hour and for co-learning with us tonight. Uh, be safe and be well. <laughs>